Good morning and I am delighted to welcome everyone to this, the second meeting of the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee in 2022. Uh, and our first item uh, on the agenda today is actually to decide whether we wish to take agenda item four in private. And can I ask colleagues if they are agreeable to that? Agreed. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we move then to the consideration of continued petitions. Uh, and I apologise, there are one or two of these petitions where the update I have to give is quite lengthy. So I do apologise in advance for... Uh, an, an uninterrupted speech, which I don't often get in the chamber. But in any event, our first petition uh, is on uh, petition number 1804, Halt Islands, Highlands and Islands, High Al Air Traffic Management Strategy, uh, lodged by Alistair McGeehan, John Doig and Peter Henderson on behalf of Benbecula Community Council. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to halt Highlands and Islands Airport's limited air traffic management strategy project to conduct an independent assessment of the decisions and decision-making process of the ATMS project. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Liam MacArthur, who's joining us online this morning, and Rhoda Grant, who is back with us in the chamber, uh, to speak to this petition. And before I, I come to both of them, uh, again, may I, just as I said a moment ago, offer a little more background. Uh, the Scottish Government's latest submission provides an update following the Assurance of Action Plan conducted in the week commencing October the 25th. The plan was set in the context of the Highlands and Islands Airports Limited, high off from here on in, announcement that a framework for discussion had been agreed with Prospect, the trade union, to establish a new way forward for the implementation of the Air Traffic Management Strategy, ATMS, programme. It noted that programme delivery activities were largely paused to enable further delivery options to be appraised. The submission confirms that the Digital Assurance Office, Portfolio Programme and Project Assurance Team and HIAL would continue to liaise to ensure that appropriate assurance arrangements were planned as decisions are taken on the programme's direction. In its most recent submission, Hyal explains that as a result of these developments, all industrial action was suspended while talks continued. In addition, new ATMS working groups were established with 27 air traffic colleagues from across several airports to help detail the benefits and risks of a potential way forward. The first of these groups met on the 6th of December. HIAL subsequently made an announcement at the end of January that the HIAL board had agreed the future strategic direction for the ATMS programme, and this will comprise a centralised surveillance operation for Sumbra, Kirkwall, Stornoway, Inverness and Indy airports, based at HIAL's existing approach radar facility on the Inverness airport site. Air traffic tower services will continue to be provided locally at each of these airports. A late submission from the petitioners commenting on the detail of this announcement has been circulated to members. In summary, the petitioners raised concerns about the timescales for these new developments, the £9 million spent so far, the implementation of surveillance radar, concerns regarding the timeline for Inverness to be granted controlled airspace, whether High Isle intends to introduce controlled airspace at Dundee, Stornoway, Kirkwall and Wick and when, Bambecula and Wick moving from ATC to AFIS, what will happen to New Century House, the building bought to house the combined surveillance centre and remote tower centre. And the petition asks that the committee correspond directly with the CAA regarding the issues he raises and would also welcome the opportunity to discuss these concerns with the committee in person. I understand uh, we heard from the petitioner um, two years ago. Uh, like others, I got quite excited when I saw uh, Reporting Scotland feature uh, announcements in relation to all of this. I thought maybe we were seeing progress of some kind, but the petitioner is <laughs> underwhelmed, to say the least. And before we consider it as a committee, um, I'd like to invite both Liam and Rhoda Grant to advise if there's anything you'd like to update us further on. We, we don't want to hear the original petition all over again, Mr MacArthur, but if there's anything you'd like to update us on, can I come to you first? Thank you very much, uh, Kabira, and I will try to be as brief as possible. And the petitioner has set out very well some of the outstanding uh, issues that remain. Uh, I think it's not at all clear, for example, where uh, this idea of um, radar surveillance um, has come from. Um, it certainly begs some questions about the three and a half million pounds that was spent on New Century House that now seems to be a rather expensive. A white elephant uh, in, in relation to ATMS. And I think that speaks to the, the, the concerns that both Rhoda and I, and more importantly, the petitioners were raising previously about the, 
the, the, the incremental costs that have been incurred through this uh, process um, for, for, um, uh, for an objection, uh, objective that, that um, was, was seen as the only show in town and then uh, and now miraculously um, has been uh, temporarily dumped. I think there's an ongoing concern for a convener that um, uh, that HIAL may simply dust down um, the remote tower proposals um, four or five years down the line and seek to, to reintroduce them. Uh, I, I think the, the, the other point I'd perhaps uh, stress at this point is the, um, the, 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 the extent to which they're relying on cooperative surveillance. I think there's been some suggestions from HIAL that this was um, this was kind of oven ready and, 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 and ready to go. Uh, that has absolutely, I think, been refuted by the CAA. And it would certainly be interesting to hear uh, what um, HIAL's uh, response to that challenge is, because fundamentally, if the CAA are not convinced, then this just isn't going to get off the ground. So I, I think there are many, many questions there that, that um, are left to be answered. I think the, the, the immediate risk to, to, to jobs in, in, in the islands and at the other uh, airports um, appears to have been lifted. Uh, but I think there is some deep anxiety both about the, the medium to longer term, but also Hyle's handling of a, of a project that just seems to have been calamitous and, and, and it looks set to um, rack up more and more costs at the, at the public expense. So, if the, the committee um, were minded and, and, and had uh, time available to hear directly from uh, the petitioners, I, I think that would be um, I, I think that would be very valuable uh, in laying out more detail. Uh, I think some of the issues the committee could, could usefully continue uh, to, to keep under review. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. McArthur. Can I ask you, sorry, um, is it the immediate lifting of threat to jobs that has maybe underpinned prospects? Kind of welcome of the of the immediate issue. Have you have you any contact with them that you can uh, advise us of? Yeah, I, I think I think that must be um, the, uh, the 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 motivation. Um, I, I think we got to an impasse where. Uh, in a sense, as I say, Heil was suggesting that the only way of uh, achieving the modernisation that everybody accepts is, is necessary in terms of future of air traffic services in the region, and that the remote towers is the only way of achieving that. I think um, having reached an agreement that lifts that immediate threat to the jobs, uh, perhaps a prospect um, feels that um, things have been moved on, but certainly there's an anxiety amongst um, staff um, at a local level that um, this is, in a sense, Simply at high or buying the time they were always going to need um, in, in terms of trying to achieve a, the, the remote tower. So the, the, that anxiety is, is, is certainly there. I'd be interested to know whether Prospect themselves believe that to, to still be the case, but certainly amongst um, a number of their members and, and, and staff locally, I would say in, in Orkney, and I, I understand that at other airports remain anxious about um, the, uh, the, the, the longer term intentions of the high management. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Th th thank you, convener, and um, I agree with everything that Liam has said. But I think it's welcome news that there has been a pause in all of this, because that's what Prospect were asking for, and indeed the staff and the communities were asking for, because they wanted time to look at the alternative solutions, because nobody's arguing that we don't need to improve safety. Um, but what was being argued was that these proposals didn't really provide additional safety, but were centralisation and they were going to cause huge economic damage and not provide the safety that people wanted. So I think there's a number of things I would be really grateful if the committee would, would look at. And one is um, the proposed discussions with regard to Ben Bekula and Wick. Now, that was quite overlooked because of the enormity of the, the proposals that impacted on all, all airports. But there is real concern that the downgrading of Ben Bekula and Wick will go ahead. And um, they really need safe surveillance and they need air traffic control based locally because both those areas um, are looking at being sites for satellite launches. So they need a safe airspace. And Benbecula is also host to Kinetics Hebrides range, which means that there is a, quite often when there's tests um, taking place, there's a huge amount of air activity there. So, and, and I think the Hebrides range also 
provides a potential solution in that they have radar there. So HIAR could work with them to provide that um, in Benbecula at a very affordable cost without huge um, um, disruption. Also in Benbecula, if you remember, one of the issues for all of this was the um, recruitment of air traffic control staff. But the staff in Benbecula that carry out air traffic control tend to be young, so they've got staff into the future. They're local people. They're not going to move any, anywhere. Um, and that they were going to be lost to Hyal and will be lost to Hyal if they, if they um, stop air traffic control there. There's also talk of a new island's impact assessment, so any downgrade in Benbecula should surely wait um, for that island's impact assessment to be done, because that's within the spirit of the law. Also, with regard to WIC, um, people will be aware of the, down, uh, the closing of Dunray and um, the need for a real economic focus in the area. And now there's a lot of work going on with regard to renewables and maintenance of devices as well. But they need good um, air traffic um, links to other parts of the UK to be able to attract those jobs. So it's very important that they have a safe airspace. And indeed, we're looking um, at trying to encourage more traffic in there. Um, I, um, I think I won't, I won't repeat, Convener, what you said yourself about the CAA and what they were saying, but certainly it would be well worth um, the committee speaking to the CAA and finding out um, what, what is um, happening there, because there's, there's some discussion as well around WIC and maybe being managed from Orkney, and I think the CAA were not keen. Um, Staff recruitment is the other thing. Now, HIAL used to be really, really good at this. They used to recruit from their communities, train them up, and those people obviously stayed. It was in Inverness they had the biggest recruitment issue where people were tended to be more mobile. So to make them look at that again and make sure they start the recruitment process again, because that's one of the provisos um, that they're stepping back. If they can't recruit, they're saying they're going to continue as was. Um, and... Also, I know the petitioners were keen to see the second Digital, Scot Aud Digital Audit Scotland report published. Hi, I'll have it. So it would be useful if the committee would ask them to publish that as well. And there's the issue of the centralisation of radar surveillance into Inverness. And that doesn't make sense, given we're going to have air traffic control at the airports. So maybe some scrutiny on how that was reached. And I know there is real uh, concerns in Shetland about this, because they do have their own radar locally. And the thought of that being centralised away to Inverness might have an, uh, an impact on them. So... Um, the other things mentioned, like New Century House and, and the like, I, I would agree with as well, but I don't want to repeat everything given. No, thank you for that. Thank you uh, both. In fact, I, uh, clearly there are a number of increasingly kind of focused but quite serious issues. Colleagues, whenever you like to come in. David Torrens. Thank you, Convener. Uh, this petition has been going on quite a while since the last session, and we've not been updated by the petitioner for a long time. And I'm sure, like myself, a committee member, have got a, a number of questions we would actually like to ask the petitioner, but also high on management. So I would like to see if we could bring the petitioner in for evidence and high on management, so we could ask him. Yeah. Thank you. Just turn to anybody else. Alexander Stewart. Convener, I would, I would very much concur with that. Uh, we have looked at this in depth but it now seems there are more questions than answers from the information we've now received. So it would be useful to get the petitioner in. I think there are also questions to be asked of the CAA uh, in what they're doing with HIAL, uh, and I think that would be useful to try and have some correspondence uh, with them uh, with reference to the, the cooperative radar system that's been discussed in the papers. Uh, but I do think that more information is required for us to really understand. It's very useful to have the the other members who have given us a lots of detail, uh, but there are still questions that I think we can ask from the petitioner and from the CAA. Thank you. Uh, Mr MacArthur, you would like to come back into our consideration. Well, thanks very much, Convener. I, I will be um, extremely brief. Um, can I very much welcome the, the Vice Convener and Alexander Stewart's um, comments there. I, I think just following on from what Rhoda said in relation to, to local recruitment, I think that is um, absolutely essential. It, when they did it last time, they almost made an exemplar of it. 
um, since then they, they moved away from that model and, and sought to kind of hire ready-made um, uh, air traffic controllers, uh, which was always a kind of short-term um, fix and, and, and has left, I think, the, the, uh, the, the company uh, with some issues in relation to, uh, to certainly to retention. Uh, I think it would offer a, a degree of, of reassurance to, to staff at the various airports if I were to embark now on a local recruitment drive, uh, which has proven itself in the past to be the best way of, uh, of not just recruiting but retaining um, staff, and, and, and uh, I think if you have Hyle management in front of you, um, that is a, a question that could be very, very usefully asked. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, can I say to you, in your role as deputy presiding officer, that you promoted Mr. Stewart there? I mean, in fact, my deputy convener is in fact David Torrance. But uh, we'll... uh, no, I, it's, sorry, I was talking about the, de the deputy convener and uh, Alexander Stewart rather than the deputy <laughs> well, convener. And Alexander Stewart. <laughs> well, well, thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do, because obviously uh, David Torrance was on the uh, previous petitions committee who heard from the petitioners. Uh, and I think given the recent moves that there has been, I am minded to uh, fall in very much with the suggestion that we have Heil. I, I think we might write to the CAA in the first instance to get their views on the petitioners' latest concerns. I think I quite like something from Prospect as well in terms of the welcome they've given and what underpins that and if where they now, now sit in that process it may well be that would lead to us um inviting them as well to give evidence uh, i think uh, so the petitioner Hyal and uh, prospect at the moment i think anybody else any suggestions or does that seem reasonable paul sweeney can you know, I'd be interested to hear more from operators of the airspace, as in, for example, Logan Air, um, people are actually going to be using it um, to understand what their concerns might be. Um, so whether it's the training school at Dundee Airport the, and then the main scheduled carrier, which is Logan Air, I'd be interested just to get a sip. Okay. We haven't heard anything from them, I don't think. No, thank probably. you. I was just going to ask the clerks whether that had been part of any continuing uh, evidence Right. Could we just review that and then potentially uh, see whether the, there's scope to uh, follow up on Paul Sweeney's suggestion in relation to any evidence we might take? Because I think that would be very much another facet of the approach that has to be understood. Um, are we content with all? Or, or do we want? I mean, I, is there anything for us at this stage to write to the Minister of Transport on? Or are we content to take evidence in the first instance? I think we are. It, well, thank you all very much, and hopefully that uh, takes us forward a little bit, uh, and we can make our own contribution to this uh, long-standing issue. Uh, our next petition is petition number uh, 1812, Protect Scotland's Remaining Ancient Native and Semi-Native Woodlands and Woodland Floors, lodged by Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker with the, on behalf of Help Trees Help Us. It calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to deliver world-leading legislation giving Scotland's remaining fragments of ancient, native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors full legal protection. Um, initially, they'd hoped before COP26 in Glasgow uh, last November. And I'm delighted to welcome Jackie Bailey to our meeting this morning. And before I come to Jackie, uh, a little background. The committee last considered this position on the 8th of September last. We agreed to write then to the Scottish Government to seek an update on its response to the Deer Working Group. To date, no response has been received from the Scottish Government. However, the petitioners themselves have uh, made a further submission, raising concerns that Scotland's ancient woodland, Atlantic rainforest, country parks, remote glens, areas of outstanding beauty and farmland, are all now being overrun by invasive non-native ecosystem engineer conifer species. The submission explains that this species already covers around one-sixth of the country, uh, where conifers are not being deliberately planted and they are planting themselves. It's the petitioner's understanding that Scotland added around 10,500 hectares of new invasive conifer-dominated plantations last year and is aiming to plant a further 18,000 each year for timber. This will be filled by 24. 
the submission explains that in the first part of the United Nations COP15 Biodiversity Conference in China, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform and Biodiversity Stated Invasive Species and Destructive Land Use are two of the five biggest threats to the natural world. The petitioners explained that the UK law on escaped non-native trees is set out in the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 and states any person who plants or otherwise causes to grow any plant in the wild at a place out with its native range is guilty of an offence. The petitioner is concerned that no one appears to be upholding this law, with the forestry industry being exempt. The petitioner calls for the Act change to reflect the growing scientific understanding of the impact of invasive ecosystem engineers, as well as the forest industry's inability to manage the risks associated with planting invasive conifers across Scotland. I should express disappointment we've not had a response from the Scottish Government, uh, but I'm very happy to invite Jackie Bailey, who's with us this morning, to update us with any comments she may wish to contribute. Thank you very much, convener. And given your um, comprehensive introduction to the petition, you've taken most of my comments away. I'm worried that um, that might be the so case. <laughs> But I am grateful to you and to the committee for the opportunity to speak to this petition um, from Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker, both of whom are my constituents. Now, members will know that I am not an expert in ancient or native woodland, um, but in learning about the petition, I am absolutely persuaded of the need to protect our woodlands, and I therefore hope the committee will support the aims of the petition. Um, the petitioners do believe that our ancient and native woodlands are being colonised. I have copies of pictures that I don't know whether it's appropriate to circulate to members of the committee, but I think a picture um, does what a thousand words don't do, and it shows you the invasion of um, non-native species to, to our countryside. Um, Scotland's ancient woodlands, its Atlantic rainforest, other land is being colonised by invasive non-native conifer species, which already covers, as you said yourself, con convener, one-sixth of the country. Um, it is interesting to note that while New Zealand, which is remarkably similar to Scotland, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars removing invasive conifers, we have the opposite situation in Scotland. And as you rightly referenced, 10,500 hectares um, in the last year, with an ambition for an additional 18,000 hectares each year for the next um, three years. But New Zealand isn't alone. Irish authorities have issued contracts as well for the removal of self-seeded conifers in an attempt to protect their woodlands from being colonised in a similar way. As I understand it, conifers take anything from 6 to 40 years to mature. They produce copious seeds, which can live in the soil for decades before they actually germinate. And once they take hold, they rapidly invade, they outgrow and they destroy native woodlands. Another set of issues um, is the impact on local communities, which members may themselves have experienced. These are often plantations promoted by faceless investment companies, some of them global actors, able to buy up land in Scotland. The Daily Record, in an article a few days ago, described the tax haven companies like Gresham House that are taking advantage of tree planting in Scotland. Their investment opens access to tax breaks. There are no income tax, no corporation tax, no capital gains tax in relation to growing timber. In their brochures, these investment companies talk about forestry funds providing their high net worth clients with inheritance tax efficient structures. Now, I know I digress slightly, but the committee should be aware of the motivation of some of these companies. It's not about climate change or the environment. It's about tax efficient funds. Some might even describe it as tax avoidance funds for wealthy clients. These companies outbid local communities for land, and often the farmers in these areas are extremely concerned that productive land is lost. Community consultation is meaningless, and road safety concerns about large haulage lorries going through small rural communities are swept aside. And I know this because there is currently a consultation affecting my area for a 200-acre afforestation scheme at Stuck and Duff involving the one and only Gresham House. In nature and in life, it is all about balance. It would be interesting, therefore, to know how many commercial afforestation schemes there are, how many are conifers, how many are native woodland. As the original petition noted, 
We only have something like 1% of our ancient woodland left. We need to protect the remaining fragments of that ancient woodland, semi-native woodland, and indeed the woodland floor as well, for future generations. And that does mean providing full legal protection. Let me turn to the law in closing, convener. You were right to reference the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981, because it does state that any person who plants or otherwise causes to grow any plant in the wild at a place out with its native range is guilty of an offence. The forestry industry is exempt. But I would be curious to know how often this has been enforced in Scotland in the last 41 years, and indeed why there are no controls on the forestry industry, because they will have a direct impact on our ancient woodlands. Let me leave you with a surprising fact, which I confess to not being aware of before, and indeed the convener referenced it himself. And that is, according to the UN COP15 in China, invasive species and destructive land use are two of the five biggest threats to the natural world. I certainly didn't know that before. So surely, convener, it's time for Scotland to update its legal framework to take account of that growing body of knowledge of the impact of non-native invasive species and act to protect what remains of our ancient native woodland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Bailey. Uh, now invite members of the committee who would wish to comment. I thought David Torrance. Thank you, convener. Um, like yourself, I was disappointed that we didn't get anything back from the Scottish Government. I'm just wondering if we could invite the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands to come and give us evidence about what's been uh, asked. Because I think it's quite concerning that the evidence has been put before us. Um, Thank you, David. Yeah. Uh, Ruth Maguire? Sorry, pressing up with myself there. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a, a really important topic and I'd be interested to hear um, directly from from the, the cab sec as well. I think it's, it allows us to, to move things along a bit quicker than the letter writing seems to have done in this instance. And I think it's um, it'd be it'd be helpful to hear from. Her. Are you waving a pen, Alexander Stewart, or I seeking am. to catch my eye? Thank, <laughs> thank you, convener. <clears throat> yes, uh, I would also uh, indicate the disappointment at not having a response from the from the Scottish government on this issue. Uh, and I think that it is very much in our favour if we do invite the Cabinet Secretary to now come. Uh, the evidence we've heard, and it's useful to have the photographic evidence as well, uh, does indicate, uh, and Ms Bailey uh, gave us a, a very informed uh, approach, and it would be useful to get the Cabinet Secretary to answer some of those questions that were posed uh, during that submission. Thank you. Are you content with Paul Sweeney? Um, Thank you, Convener. I think it is incredibly important. Um, certainly during COP26, RSPB did a fantastic uh, showcase on Scotland's rainforests, which was quite an eye-opening educational experience. And I think a lot of people don't realise that rainforests exist in Scotland in a temperate climate. Um, so I think there's probably a broader need to mobilise a debate around this issue. Um, so I wonder whether we ought to consider a wider group of stakeholders to take evidence from and to broaden the base of the evidence we're seeking to to obtain, perhaps thinking of the Forestry Commission, RSPB, just as two suggestions. Um, but it definitely is an urgent concern, particularly the nature of the invasive um, growth in existing ancient woodland um, and the displacement um, caused by conifer plantations, which I think were originally planted for this First World War. Um, I think that, that's the origin of the Forestry Commission. So it was about war needs basically to rapidly grow timber, but obviously it's had severe long-term effects over the last century. Thank you very much. Uh, but I'm very much welcome all of the comments from the committee. Can I thank you, uh, Jackie Bailey, because I thought that was a very helpful, comprehensive suggestion. Um, our original thought was we might write to the Cabinet Secretary again, but um, given the focus there is in Scotland on the whole environmental agenda and the importance of this issue, it does seem to be one of those things that this Petitions Committee was designed to pick up and actually make some running with and interrogate in some detail. Uh, I would very much welcome, I think, that the suggestion that we have the Cabinet Secretary here. I'm happy to concur in, in the other suggestions that were made by uh, Mr Sweeney. I think we might, because actually I do think the photographs are very helpful in terms of illustrating what invasion can look like. I'm very happy for the Cabinet Secretary's sight of these before we, uh, he comes to give evidence, so there is an understanding of the practical reality 
uh, that we can see and that I imagine were the petitioners responsible for these, Miss Bailey? Yeah. They, they were indeed. My they... photographic skills are not as good as theirs. <laughs> uh, no comment. And I, I, I'll, thank, I'll thank them very much as well. Um, I'm just wondering whether we would like to have the petitioners involved in that as well. I think it might, as a courtesy, be nice to have them given the opportunity to... I think that would certainly be welcomed by the petitioners. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So we're content. We are. Thank you, uh, Miss Bailey. Thank you all very much for your contribution in relation to that petition. We move on then to petition number 1860, which is New Legislation for Prescription and Limitation Act, uh, which is uh, lodged by... Uh, Jennifer Morrison Holdham calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to amend the Prescription and Limitation Act to allow retrospective claims to be made. Uh, the petition was last considered the 17th of November. Members will recall that in her previous submission, the Minister for Community Safety advised the committee that the Scottish Government does not hold data relating to the exercise of Section 19 of the Prescription and Limitation Act 1973, and that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service cannot interrogate the information it holds as it is held in a court interlocutor. The committee therefore agreed to write to the Minister to ask how the Scottish Government intended to address the data gap identified by this petition. I think we were all quite surprised. The Minister promised to write once again to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to raise the issue with them. The Minister also notes that Section 19A empowers the Court to disapply the time limit and that this discretion is unfettered, stating that what matters is the circumstances in which the Courts have exercised the discretion, not necessarily the number of times it has been exercised. Um, uh, colleagues, I, I mean, I, I thought that the response we received from the Minister was the response we might have hoped to receive the first time round, actually. Uh, but can I ask if there are any comments from the committee? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if we could write to the Minister um, for Community Safety for an update on how we, should, how we got on with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Indeed. Uh, I don't know when we can expect that the Minister will have written, but I mean, I think we will chase that up until we get some understanding of what has progressed. Is there any other recommendation at this stage? No. Thank you. Um, petition number 1862, to introduce community representation and boards of public organisations delivering lifeline services to island communities, lodged by uh, Ronan Mackay, Angus Campbell and Naomi Bremner on behalf of the Youth Economic Task Force. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce community representation and boards of public organisations, delivering lifeline services to island communities in keeping with the Island Scotland Act 2018. I'm delighted both online to welcome uh, back Liam MacArthur and to welcome Alistair Allen uh, to the committee to speak to this petition. Uh, before I come to our guests, uh, just a very little additional background. We last considered this petition on the 1st of September 2021. And at that meeting, the committee discussed an earlier submission by the Scottish Government, which explained that the requirements for the appointments to a public body board are set out in the public body's founding legislation. The committee highlighted that there was, quote, nothing in the Scottish Government's submission to suggest that it has any plans to amend founding legislation for public bodies on the basis that lifeline services to island communities require community representation on their boards. The committee therefore agreed to write to the Scottish Government to clarify whether it had any plans to amend founding legislation for such a purpose. And uh, as with our last petition, um, we've had no response as yet from the Scottish Government ahead of our consideration today. However, very happy to bring in both of our parliamentary colleagues for further comment, and I'll ask Alistair Allen if he'd like to comment first. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Rona Mackay, Angus Campbell and Naomi Bremner for the work they've done in my constituency on behalf of the US Economic Task Force and bringing this petition to you. Um, as island communities, we are all reliant on lifeline transport links, and they're vital to every aspect of our lives. However, the organisations that are tasked with delivering these services have virtually no one with experience of actually living in the communities they serve on their boards. And uh, the petitioner's submission, rightly in my view, 
states that the community and place should be at the heart of good government. Given that the principal mission of organisations such as David McBrain Limited, Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited, and Highlands and Islands Airports is to serve island communities, uh, it is not in the interest of good governance uh, of the boards of these organisations to be as remote from their service users as they currently are. I say that as no criticism convener of existing board members, but I do not think any of them probably face the experience which I, fairly enough, have of hearing people's views about CalMAC services literally every time I go to buy a pint of milk. Now, since the, the committee last considered this petition in early September, as you said, I led a members' debate in the Chamber on reserving seats for islanders on the boards of CalMAC. There was a large degree of cross-party consensus on the need for more representation of islanders. The Transport Minister at the time, Graham Day, also signalled that the Scottish Government uh, is open to changes. And in responding to a recent parliamentary question of mine, the Minister also stated that he had tasked the newly appointed Chair of David McBrain on appointing ways of getting an island-based presence on these boards. Briefly, one other development uh, relevant to a previous um, petition you have just heard this morning, convener, uh, is that Hyal recently confirmed, Hi have recently confirmed uh, they will now be taking a different approach to their ATMS plans on uh, air traffic control jobs. This issue also partly motivated the petition we are presently discussing today. I think it comes after five years of bitter dispute with the communities affected and the Air Traffic Controllers Trade Union. I think it is fair to speculate on whether this would have been as long as acrimonious uh, uh, and protracted if more board members of that organisation had been based in island communities. So in closing, I will borrow a point made by Rona Mackay from UIST uh, to me. Uh, last year, UIST and Lewis both won titles of uh, Social Enterprise Places of the Year. That is a, con- that's a testament to the large number of social enterprises in the islands which each have unpaid boards of islanders. Islanders are not strangers to boards, and nor relevantly here uh, are there any shortage of islanders who know about seafaring. There exists a large and healthy degree of involvement in public life in the islands. It would be in everyone's interest that could be utilised in the boards of the organisations delivering lifeline services to them. So I would urge the committee, if it is their uh, wish to do this, to keep this petition open. Uh, and to push for changes in the criteria of board appointments in the organisations we have discussed today to give much more prominence to experience of living in an, an island community. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Allen. Uh, in the interim, unfortunately, uh, Mr MacArthur has been called to another meeting, so we do not have his further contribution to hear. And I wonder if members of the committee would like to comment. Ruth Maguire. I, mean, I, I think that um, the, the, the update on the, the members' debate was interesting there, and, and um, Alistair Allen indicated that the, the transport secretary at the time was open to, to that suggestion. So I wonder if the best thing for us to do is to write to the, the, the cabinet secretary and ascertain what their, what their current um, position is and, and take things from there, really. Yeah, are we agreed with that? I, I think, and I think we could reference that very much on the back of the members' debate, to which Mr. Allen uh, drew attention uh, in terms of uh, there being quite a wide cross-party uh, interest in the issues underpinning this. Uh, I think we'll see what the cabinet secretary says in response to all of this, and uh, it may well be that, in fact, that leads to an evidence session with the on this issue at a later date, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Convener. Is it also worth making the lead committee aware of this petition in the sense that it might be worth an inquiry into the basis on which public appointments are made to the boards of particularly CalMAC uh, and CMAL? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm approaching it less from a rural perspective and more from a shipbuilding perspective, but my understanding is the board is, is, is problematic, to say the least, in how it's governing that, in, that agency. Um, and I think there is very little public oversight of the sort of characters that have been appointed to these boards and the potential for conflicts of interest and just a- ignorance of many other aspects of how the organisation should be operating. Thank you. Could I suggest maybe the clerks liaise with the clerks of that committee uh, just to see what understanding they have of this issue and maybe then come back to us and then we can decide from there what how that might fit in with anything we're doing. We agreed. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen, as well. Um, we move then to petition number 1864.
uh, to increase the ability of communities to influence planning decisions on on far on on shore wind farms. Sorry, um, this has been uh, lodged by. Aileen Jackson, on behalf of Scotland Against Spin, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to increase the ability of communities to influence planning decisions for onshore wind farms by adopting English planning legislation for the determination of onshore wind farm developments, empowering local authorities to ensure local communities are given sufficient professional help to engage in the planning process, and appointing an independent advocate to ensure that local participants are not bullied and intimidated during public inquiries. Last considered by us on the 1st of September last, the committee agreed to write to a range of stakeholders. A pleased to say we responses have now been received from Scottish Renewables, Planning Aid Scotland, the Royal Town Planning Institute and the petitioners. And we've also received a late submission, which uh, colleagues will have, from Finlay Carson, MSP, in support of the petition. The submissions we received were very detailed and comprehensive, so I'd like to thank those who've taken the time to submit their views to us, to research the information and to uh, forward it to us on this petition. And all of these submissions have been shared with members. Uh, as part of the papers you've received in advance, and they're all publicly available for people following our proceedings on the petition's website. The common themes across these submissions include the role of local planning authorities as decision makers, ensuring communities have access to professional help in navigating the planning process, ensuring communities have early notification of Section 36 applications, capacity issues for local authorities in relation to meeting future net zero targets, potential learning from elsewhere in the UK, from example, local authorities applying English planning law, the use of inquiries and how communities can best contribute to these mechanisms to enable any issues with a developer's conduct to be formally raised. Do the members have any comments or suggestions for action? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, the sub submissions have been very detailed, but there are still a lot of questions I think that need to be answered. I'm wondering if we could invite the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport to provide evidence to the committee. Any other comment? Alexander Stewart. Yeah, I, I would agree, Convener, that the, the information that we received from uh, these organisations and individuals is very comprehensive. And once again, it gives us the opportunity to put some of these to uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, when uh, and if they attend uh, and take uh, uh, response and evidence at, at the committee. Thank you. Ruth Maguire. Convener, just briefly, the, the issues that seem to be raised feel to me a bit more like a planning issue rather than, although it's specifically about, <clears throat> excuse me, wind farms which are about energy, the, the actual issues feel like it's more of a planning thing than a environmental. I don't, I'd be interested to hear others' reflections on that. Thank you. Paul Sweeney. Yeah, for, yeah. further to that, um, I think with the new national planning framework being developed currently, um, it might be an opportune moment to try and be clear about feeding this into the process. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head who the relevant minister is that's leading that effort, but it would be worthwhile perhaps to engage with them uh, in light of the, the evidence being raised here. Okay. Uh, I think there's a willingness for us to take evidence, but we want to be sure we're taking evidence from the right source, so we'll just clarify. Yeah, happy to delegate the decision yes. to you. Yeah, happy to delegate. You're happy to delegate the decision to me as to who that would be. I, I, uh, the other group I'm, I suppose I'm quite interested to hear on, there's repeated references to the uh, powers that local authorities in England have in relation to all of this. And I just wonder if we could maybe touch base with a representative organisation of local authorities in England to understand a little bit better about the actual um, application of that. I mean, it keeps getting referred to, but I'd like to know whether in practice that has actually worked in the way that is being suggested and whether you know there are any concerns or anxieties amongst them about the responsibility that has been that, that has been uh, devolved to them. Um, otherwise, are we content to proceed on that basis? We are. Thank you. Uh, our next petition is number 1865 to suspend all surgical mesh and fixation devices. Uh, and this, I again apologise, quite a long preamble uh, this morning. 
Um, this has been lodged by Rosanna Clarkin, Lauren McDougall and Graham Robertson and calls on the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to suspend the use of all surgical mesh and fixation devices. And this has had something of an airing in the um, Parliament uh, just in relation to the bill which has recently passed in relation to the compensation for the transvaginal mesh surgery. However, it calls on us to uh, suspend uh, the use while a review of all surgical procedures which use polyester, polypropylene or titanium is carried out. Guidelines for surgical use of mesh are established. The petition was last considered on 17th of November and at that meeting the committee agreed to write to the Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport and Shoulders Hospital in Canada. Uh, responses from have been received from the Minister, the Shoulders Hospital, uh, Sling the Mesh campaign and the petitioners. Uh, I'm delighted that Jackie Bailey is still with us this morning uh, and I'm also delighted to welcome online uh, Carol Morkin, MSP, both of whom wish to speak to this petition. And before I bring in my colleagues, uh, I'll provide a little bit more of the background uh, that I apologise for the length of a moment ago. Uh, in 2019, the Scottish Health Technologies Group, SHTG, carried out a review into the use of mesh in primary inguinal hernia repair in men. This concluded that compared to non-mesh procedures, using mesh resulted in lower rates of recurrence, lower rates of serious adverse events and similar or lower risk of chronic pain. The advice for NHS Scotland was therefore that surgical mesh should be used in elective repairs in inguinal hernia in adult males. The SHTG review was subsequently expanded to include women, examining the outcome of mesh versus non-mesh surgery in a variety of groin or abdominal wall hernias. The Scottish Health Technologies Group concluded that current evidence does support the continued availability of surgical mesh for elective repair of primary ventral hernias incisional hernias and primary inguinal hernias in adults in Scotland. The group recommends, however, that consideration should be given to patient reference and that patients should also have access to alternative hernia treatment options such as non-mesh, suture and natural tissue repair. The Chief Medical Officer has also undertaken a number of activities relevant to this petition, including writing to the Board Executives and Medical Directors to draw their attention to the SHTG report's findings, asking health boards to consider the availability of non-mesh surgery within their health board and how any skills gaps where they exist can be addressed, asking health boards to consider the development of local clinical groups and broader clinical networks for the management of complex cases, and asking medical directors to remind clinicians of their obligations under the principle of realistic medicine, of informed consent, and the importance of recording both the content and outcome of such discussions. Now, with regard to the issues raised with the quality and authenticity of certain materials being used, the Minister states that the Scottish Government contacted the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency, MHRA, in 2018, who confirmed there was no evidence to prompt regulatory action and the products in question remained acceptably safe when used as intended. The committee also wrote to Shoulders Hospital in Canada as the leading experts in natural tissue repair. Uh, in what I thought was a fascinating submission, Shoulders states in relation to its own practice, surgical mesh is not used unless absolutely necessary and that has led to it being used in less than 2% of cases. The hospital specialises exclusively in abdominal wall hernia repair, where the body's natural tissue is strong enough to support the surgical repair, natural tissue repair should always be used. Where underlying patient tissue is poor, surgical mesh may be necessary in some femoral and large incisional hernia repairs. All surgeons are trained to do a natural tissue repair as their first choice, Natural tissue repair should be the first choice for all primary inguinal hernias, most recurrent inguinal hernias, most femoral hernias, most epigastric and umbilical hernias, and small incisional hernias. Shoulders also notes that the recurrence rate for inguinal hernia repair, over 85% of most of their hernia repair, since mesh was introduced in the 80s, has not improved. There has been a staggering increase in post-operative complications not seen prior to mesh. Chronic and debilitating pain and other severe complications such as mesh shrinkage, mesh migration and related nerve entrapment are widespread. There are no side effects of tissue repair if it's done correctly. Training for surgeons on natural tissue technique ranges from three months for an experienced fellowship general surgeon 
to six to nine months for an inexperienced general surgeon. The Sling the Mesh campaign shared the results of their recent survey of its 9,300 members with experience of vaginal, abdominal, pelvic, rectal, hernia mesh and mesh following mastectomy, noting that one in four have considered taking their life. Six in ten suffered depression. One third have been forced to give up their work. One in four now need a stick to walk and one in 14 who now need a mobility scooter or wheelchair. In their submissions, the petitioners welcome the information contained in the Shoulders Hospital submission and ask for further information to be sought on the use of Protax, that's devices used to fix mesh to soft tissue. The petitioners believe there is evidence to suggest that a considerable sum of money has been spent recently procuring hernia mesh and other fixation devices and they feel that this money could have been spent on investigating and teaching natural tissue repair. The petitioners also query why mesh is still being bought and why pl clinicians are not yet accurately and systematically recording the effects of this material on patients. So we've gathered quite a lot of evidence since we last considered the petition and I'm going to invite both uh, Jackie Bailey and Carol Mocken to contribute ahead of committee uh, comment. Uh, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener, and again, many thanks to yourself and the committee for allowing me to speak to this petition. Um, and given your detailed knowledge and interest in this area, I feel as if I'm pushing at an open door. Um, I have been contacted by one of the petitioners, Rosanna Clarkin, um, and she shared with me the evidence you've referenced from Shouldice Hospital in Canada, and I know the committee have seen that evidence. But I have also been emailed in the last week by a number of men and women across Scotland who have experienced post-operative complications after the use of mesh. Um, their stories, frankly, are heartbreaking. Um, they're living in excruciating pain. Many of them have had to give up work. Their fears are somehow being dismissed as psychological and not physical. Um, some have had to go private because the NHS is refusing to help them. And some have been so low they've considered taking their own lives. Now, these stories, convener, you will appreciate, are remarkably similar to the stories we heard from women who experienced difficulties as a consequence of transvaginal mesh. Um, and the evidence of problems with mesh does appear to be increasing, not just in this country, but in other countries around the world. So I am astonished that on the 25th of January, the Scottish Government signed a deal with mesh providers to provide more mesh for more mesh surgeries for the next 24 months at a cost of £3.5 million. I equally am not aware of whether it is a matter of routine for alternative surgeries to be offered, and I wonder whether that's something that the committee would consider exploring. So given the experience of the transvaginal mesh campaigners, I would ask that the committee ask for an independent review, not an internal review, um, and get the data to understand the scale of the problem that, that is starting to emerge here and to consider um, asking the Scottish Government for measure of removal and other mitigations for those affected. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Bailey. Uh, Carol Mochan. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, um, coming quite new to the subject matter, I wanted to place on record that I am interested um, and I'm interested in the way this matter has progressed because similar to uh, others on the committee, I have been involved in the mesh debates with the women around the transvaginal mesh. And so it seems important that we take uh, evidence that we have from other areas. Um, so can I say that I support the overall sentiment of the petition and I feel it's a perfectly reasonable request that a review is held and that guidelines for surgical use of mesh are established. Um, the petitioners have brought forward evidence to the minister, and obviously you've gone over other e evidence. And I think it is incumbent on us to ensure reasonable requests are respected. And it does seem reasonable to me that the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee take action um, and at least further scrutinise um, what can be done to support this pet petition. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity, and I hope to keep um, a, an eye on what is happening around Mesh uh, for, for these people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for that. Uh, members of the committee who might wish to comment. Uh, Alexander Stewart and then Paul Sweeney. <clears throat> thank you, convener. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed at what has already been achieved 
uh, through the campaigns in the past. But it would appear that lessons haven't really been learned when we're now looking at this situation, uh, because there's a real similarity between what happened to the women, which is now happening to the men. And I think the, the Shoulders Hospital report is absolutely eye-opening uh, for us to have that information and to collate some of the issues that have been raised. So I, I really do feel we need to seek more clarity on all of this, uh, and it, it, we should be at least writing to the, the Chief Medical Officer here in Scotland to ask uh, what is happening with this process. I mean, Ms Bailey's brought forward some very strong views about what is taking place and the funding that's been provided, uh, and are we just backing up some more problems for individuals for the future in all of this if we don't sa take some action uh, with this? So, so I would certainly want to write to the, the Chief Medical Officer and also uh, to ensure that the, the Minister of Public Health once again comes back to us and gives us more updates as to what is taking place here. Because, as I say, I, I would hope that throughout the whole debate and debacle that happened with transvaginal uh, mesh, that we would have learned some lessons. Uh, but it would appear that, as I say, uh, we're, we're repeating some of the failures uh, and, and we're putting these individuals uh, through the trauma uh, that happened uh, to the women in the past. Uh, and as I say, I think we need to get real clarity on this. Uh, and I would continue the petition on those grounds. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Sweeney. Yeah, thanks. I would just like to support... Um, what Jackie Bailey said in regards to the submission from Rosanna, I think it was quite shocking actually to learn that the, con the vendor uh, COVID in UK was supplying this Paratex mesh, which has been subject to FDA um, restrictions in the United States because it's been directly linked to post-operative complications and adverse effects in patients. So actually we're in a position perversely in Scotland where we have less medical clinical protections for patients than in the United States. And I'm sure if you ask the average person in the street which uh, jurisdiction they think would have, offer more protections to patients, they would say here, when actually it's, it's, as a result of this decision, not the case. So I think it's very, very critical that we, we pursue this issue. Um, and I also um, think the submission from the Shoulders Hospital offers a insight to an alternative model that is quite compelling. Um, and I think in light of that quite uh, remarkable evidence, um, it would be worth asking the, the Health Secretary to engage with it directly and perhaps look at the opportunity to set up a pilot project in Scotland with a particular hospital or a particular surgical centre to see if we can adopt those methods and use it as a control against standard procedures and see if it is, is producing dem demonstrable effects that could improve patient care. Ruth McGuire. Um, thank you. I'd, I'd, um thankful for, for, for the evidence that, that we've been given. It's certainly been um, eye-opening. I think um, one person in pain and distress and, and not being believed is one too many. Um, but that said, I think it's really important that we understand the scale. I think um, based on what's happened previously and an experience of, of what's happened to the women, um, I would actually quite like to invite the Minister to come and give us evidence. I think that to start that dialogue would be important. I think it's almost too big to just write and, and ask for some information. I think we should have a, an evidence session in, in the first instance. Thank you. Uh, we did actually have, sir, prior to your joining the committee, we did have the Minister, but I think there's every reason to suggest that we might wish to have the Minister back. David Torrance. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, like my colleagues, um, the petition is something that I'm really interested in. Somebody who's been there from the very start with the mesh ones. Um, it's really important that we get to the bottom of this. And rather than write to Chief Medical Officer, do you think we could ask him in to give evidence? Mm -hmm. And somebody from the hospital in Canada as well. If we could contact him and get them to give us evidence as well to committee so we could ask questions. And let's just push it on and progress with it. OK. Um, can I say, obviously, uh, having been associated with the MESH petition that the committee previously um, dealt with, that the associated concern of... Um, hernia mesh kind of uh, was referred to from time to time as that progressed. What there was in relation to the transvaginal mesh petition was a very immediately united, informed body of women who drove that petition forward. And the issue of hernia mesh was understood to be there, but didn't have the same profile. And what is depressing, really, is the pathway seems exactly the same. A lack of any subsequent follow-up to establish whether issues have arisen, uh, a denial 
uh, of the association of any issues with the mesh that has been fitted, the calling into question of the motivations or understanding of those who are themselves feeling pain and that pain being dismissed as not real but imagined. Uh, and while in the debates, even in recent um, legislation, I was reluctant to conflate because I felt that we didn't have necessarily the same body of evidence. As a consequence of our pursuit of this petition, I think the wider body of evidence is beginning to emerge. And I therefore think it is very much an issue that this committee and this should pursue further, leaving the petition open. And I would very much like to welcome the Minister back. I'd like the Minister to have had the opportunity to properly consider uh, the shoulders or shoulder eyes, maybe your pronunciation's better than mine, Ms Bailey, uh, evidence that we've received. Taking evidence from them would be slightly problematic, I imagine, in terms of a timeline, because <laughs> we, we, they, they'll not be working to the same clock as this committee. I imagine they're all fast asleep at the moment. But um, we, could, uh, we could think to that. But I, I would like to hear um, from the Minister, from the Chief Medical Officer, and I'd certainly like to understand in that evidence and flag up in advance this procurement of the particular uh, mesh material, because I don't quite understand why that has happened. And it, 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 all of the issues look broadly similar. And I know when we heard from the Minister last time, they talked about they were working on informed consent procedures. And it, I kind of you know, thought, well, fair enough, I mean, we've been here before. What I think we can assume is that there is now a broader body of men who have concerns. But I would like to say that I am also aware that there are a number of men who've contacted me who have had perfectly successful uh, mesh, uh, and it has made a huge difference. And I, what I want to understand is the volume and the relationship between those who feel they've had a successful and those who have had an unsuccessful. Because in the case of the transvaginal mesh, the balance was fundamentally uh, on the side of those who experienced really serious health considerations in consequence. And that may have to form the basis of any informed consent in the event that, um, that there is an argument for the this process proceeding. But are we content then to, to, to take that further evidence and to uh, consider from those parties suggested? We are. Thank you. Um, petition number 1867 uh, to establish a new national qualification for British Sign Language. Uh, and this is a, a petition lodged by Scott Macmillan. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to encourage the SQA, Scottish Qualifications Authority, to establish a national qualification in British Sign Language at uh, SQF Level 2. I'm delighted to say that our meeting has, in fact, this morning been streamed uh, in BSL for those people who have been watching and hopefully for our petitioners who may be now watching the consideration of the petition. Uh, we last considered this on the 8th of September, and at that meeting we agreed to write to the Scottish Qualifications Authority to establish whether the qualification called for in this petition could be introduced, what would be required in introducing it, and which, if any obstacles, there might be to doing so. Uh, a response has been received from the SQA. It advises that the decision regarding what qualifications must be in place to provide students with the opportunity to learn BSL or any other additional language from primary one is not strictly in the SQE's gift. It advises the committee to seek advice from those in the Scottish Government with responsibility for the language learning in Scotland, a one plus two approach policy. The submission explains that the particular qualification types that are deemed to be part of the national qualification suite include national courses and national units at each level from SCF, SCQF, sorry, level one up to SQCQF level seven. Furthermore, the different levels in the national qualifications help SQA to recognize the attainment of learners of all abilities and ensure there are appropriate progression routes. SQA advise that they would not normally seek to develop a course in a new subject at just one level. 
To ensure a fair appraisal of new requests, SQA advises that it has developed criteria which need to be met before considering developing national courses in a new language. These are evidence of demand for a course, sufficient qualified and registered teachers, strategic support from a range of partners from within Scottish education, the availability of specific grant funding from the Scottish Government. Now, the SQA advises that previously BSL has failed to meet the first and second criteria, which were the focus of considerable debate after the BSL Scotland Act was passed in 2015. And while the BSL National Plan 2017 to 23 was being developed, and those are the evidence for demand of a course and sufficient qualified and registered teachers. SQA advised that it has developed awards in BSL rather than national courses. So I think we know quite a bit more than we did before. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Uh, Mr Sweeney, thank you. Yeah. I think it, it's an interesting point about the, res the, the capacity to deliver the course. Um, and I think that's a fair, a fair response from the SQA. Um, I'm not aware of the actual number of people in Scotland who are qualified in BSL. <clears throat> but it might be worth trying to establish a, a route to a solution um, with Scottish Government colleagues. It might also be worth trying to engage with the further education sector, perhaps certain colleges who might be able to offer it um, as a qualification. And then on that basis, if, it was, if we were able to establish some understanding around the logistics of delivery, then it, it might enable the FQ to sort of work towards developing a qualification that could be offered. OK, you might not have a BSL teacher in every school in Scotland, but you might have one in... You may have the course offered at a school within a given local authority or a college in a given local authority and that would allow interested students to, to, to apply to, to do the course. Um, I'm sure there is a way of working through that issue that's been identified um, and it might be worth looking at how we can try and bring, to, bring stakeholders together to try and see if we can hammer that out. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr Sweeney. I think you've got the same sense perhaps that I have of a kind of lack of ownership of the actual direction of the pathway to a solution, and that seems to be the point. Mr Stewart? I, I, would, I would very much concur with that, Convener. I think, you know, there is a demand and capacity issue, I think, and, and there is a, a lack of possibly qualified teachers, and then there's a funding issue, and all of these would need to be uh, in place uh, for us to see if there was real opportunity. Uh, Mr. Sweeney makes a very good point about uh, having a, uh, a collective responsibility to provide it within a, a, a centre or a school or a further education. Uh, that that is, is very much part of the issue. But at the same time, if there is not the demand and there is not the resource, uh, then, then it, it makes it very difficult to understand what the situation is. So clarifying that would be very useful. Ruth McGuire. Yeah, on, in terms of demand, I'd be interested to know how the SQA assessed demand and um, whether they consulted with um, the deaf community in terms of in, in terms of that. And perhaps on that note, we should write to um, stakeholders like Deaf Action, Enquire, the National Deaf Children's Society Scotland and Scottish Children's Services Coalition, perhaps. Thank you very much. David Torrance? Um, convener, I was just going to agree with my colleague Ruth McGuire there. So she stole your thunder. She stole my thunder. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd very much like to write those organisations and the Scottish government um, just to ascertain what qualifications must be in place. Um, but I, I actually would like to write to all those parties, prefacing it by saying that the evidence the committee have received so far does actually seem to point to a lack of clarity as to where the leadership for a, a resolution of this issue might lie. I would be interested in their comments on that too, because I think we feel from the evidence we've received that, that that's actually not clear and that therefore we're amassing evidence without it being clear what actually would be the trigger to, to give effect to uh, progress. I think that's the feeling we all have. Uh, so we'll keep the petition open and proceed on that basis. Uh, thank you. Uh, petition number 1885 to make offering community shared ownership mandatory for all wind farm development planning proposals. Um, this is uh, a petition lodged by Karen Murphy calling on the Scottish Government to make community shared ownership a mandatory requirement uh, to be offered as part of all planning proposals for wind farm development. The committee wrote to the Scottish Government asking whether the Scottish Government could use existing planning powers to provide incentives for developers to offer community shared ownership. 
The Scottish Government's response highlights good practice guidance, which indicates that planning authorities should not seek to secure shared ownership through the use of planning conditions or obligations. The Energy Saving Trust suggested that the UK Government's contracts for difference could be a route to making community shared ownership offers mandatory. The Trust notes that due to competitive bidding rounds, opportunities for community shared ownership could be threatened by bidders cutting costs to try and win contracts. It was suggested that community shared ownership could be protected if additional points in the contract evaluation were awarded for bidder, bidders for offering a CSO. Community shared ownership. The petitioner raises a number of additional issues, such as her view that some developers refuse to interact with the local community, some refuse to offer community shared ownership, and that others make uh, may make community shared ownership offers that do not meet the definition of community shared ownership as defined by the Scottish Government. Energy Saving Trust and the petitioner make a number of recommendations for improvement, and all of these have been detailed to colleagues in your papers. Uh, do, any, uh, do other members have any comments or suggestions for action? David Torrance. If I could convener, um, like the previous petition, I wonder if we could get the correct minister in to ask questions about this and give us a, take some evidence from them, um, because quite important that community community ownership of these wind farms are vital to small communities and I've got several examples in the constituency where they have benefited them and um, so to me um, it's important that we take this petition forward and if we could get the relevant Minister or Cabinet Secretary to come in and give us evidence. Well we have invited the Cabinet Secretary or we've decided we will invite the Cabinet Secretary to come in in relation to Position number 1864, which is a different aspect of the whole uh, wind farm debate. So, I mean, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to try and combine this petition with that on that occasion. Uh, Ruth McGuire. Forgive me not to disagree with you, Convener, but <laughs> did we not agree to ask the planning minister in for the other one? And would it not be the... Ah, right. So, you, you know, we, we delegated it to me mm -hmm. to decide who was the appropriate minister. Yeah. You're quite right. Yeah. Uh, so it may well be that we do. It could be either or, I think, in, in, in that event. Uh, Paul Sweeney. Yeah, th th thank you, Convener. I was quite alarmed by the Scottish Government's submission in the sense that they suggest that good practice guidance and planning is that authorities shouldn't use it as leverage. I think it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do um, and actually should be actively encouraged because there's very little other, <laughs> other forms of leverage available to yeah. uh, democratic politics to over capital you know, of this nature and scale. So um, I think if, um, if you have that ability to drive a harder bargain on behalf of communities to capture some more ownership of these, uh, these projects, then that would be a worthwhile thing to further interrogate rather than just simply suggesting without any real, real further justification why it's not seen as good practice. Um, so I think further to the Minister coming to the committee, it would be good to sort of probe that particular matter um, with a view to NPF4 and how that could be changed. Um, and I think particularly with the recent commentary around the Scotland leasing round, um, and how people felt that may not have been the best deal possible. Um, I think it's a very timely issue to, to, to explore. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, the, the same thought had occurred to me. Why, why is it not uh, allowed? So therefore, um, I think very much a question that we could, you, you can put to the appropriate minister. And if colleagues are happy to delegate determining who that is again to me, then we will proceed on that basis. Uh, petition number 1887, Create an Unborn Victims of Violence Unit, lodged by Nicola Murphy, Murray. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create an Unborn Victims of Violence Act, creating a special offence that enables courts to hand down longer sentences for perpetrators of domestic violence, which causes miscarriage. The committee received submissions from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Scottish Sentencing Council, Scottish Law Commission and Victim Support Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Sentencing Council notes that it has established a committee to oversee the development of a draft guideline on domestic abuse. The Scottish Law Commission also highlights an opportunity to contribute to their programme of law reform consultation, which will open in the coming months. And in its submission, Victim Support Scotland notes its support for the petition and its aims, stating that it believes an update to the law is necessary. Uh, in view of the responses received, I welcome comments from colleagues. Ruth McGuire. I think this is a really um, important topic and, and we know that women are at increased risk of, of violence through their pregnancy and early maternity. So I would um, certainly wish to take more evidence. I think we've got some helpful stuff in, in our papers, but I'd like to see us invite the petitioner and some other stakeholders in to give, to give us evidence. 
Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Yeah, yes, Convener, I think this, this is very important. I mean, we, we've, we've discussed in the past, and, uh, and the, the Parliament has discussed this whole idea of uh, violence and, and the whole creation of this situation uh, does give us a chance to clarify and get some more, more evidence from organisations and individuals uh, who are at the coalface of all of this. Uh, and I think it's vitally important uh, that, we, that we continue to understand uh, the situation that many people find themselves in under the circumstance. Uh, and it is alarming because it seems to be growing in its, its, its propensity, and, and that in itself is a problem. Uh, so I think to, to at least have uh, the organisations, victim support and women's aid and them here would at least give us an opportunity. And it would be also useful to find out from the, the Crown Office and maybe Procurator Fiscal uh, about what they would want as well. So I think uh, having uh, some correspondence to them or inviting them to give us some uh, in insight would also be very useful. Thank you. Paul Sweeney? Yeah, I was similarly... Um you know, taken back by the you know the, the issues raised, uh, it's something that I hadn't probably given consideration to before, and I think um, a very very you know appropriate petition. Um, what I was particularly interested in was the Scottish Law Commission submission around the idea that they could potentially be looking at developing a project around this if it were to be submitted to them. Um, that might be a, a process that's worth exploring for the petitioners in addition to this committee, but also. Um, I do wonder, it's the sort of thing that might be appropriate as a member's bill um, in that sense, and I do wonder whether our colleagues in the Parliament who might be considering member's bills but don't necessarily have a project in mind, um, it's maybe there's a mechanism for our committee to flag up to colleagues if they are interested in developing a, a bill. We have potential candidates that might be worth uh, taking up. Um, and I, and I, just, I, I wonder whether we should be making fuller use of the member's bill process. Uh, and, and that could potentially be a candidate for a member's bill. Um, Thank you for that. That's a novel, <laughs> that's a novel <laughs> suggestion. Yeah. But, um, uh, but, but, uh, but, but yes, I, I mean, the, the issues are very important. In the first instance, I think we are going to seek to take evidence from the petitioners and some of the bodies that, and the bodies that Ruth McGuire suggested. I, I think we draw the petitioner's attention, as Mr Sweeney suggested. Um, I think we write to the Scottish Sentencing Council as well, just drawing them to, to the, the, their attention to the issues involved. Um, and I think just that evidence we might seek from the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal, again, trying to fathom and bottom out the, the, the scope of the uh, potential issue that we are addressing here. But, I mean, it's a very important issue and uh, lets us, in the first instance, take more, more, more evidence. Um, but it may well lead to recommendations which could form the basis of initiatives that others might wish to take forward uh, thereafter. I think that's right. I, I was almost going to say, are we able to initiate bills? But I, I don't think we, we, we I can't remember. If we, I think we are actually as a committee, so it's perfectly open to us as well. But I, we're a little bit further down the road before we get to that. But are we agreed in the first instance to hear from the, the evidence as submitted? Right. Right. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Uh, petition number one eight nine two to introduce a law that makes attacks by one dog and another a dog a crime. Uh, lodged by Evelyn Baginski, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make attacks by one dog and another dog a crime, and subject to a penalty requiring the owner to pay a fine and reimburse any expenses related to the incident. The initial Scottish Government response outlined existing legislation and recent consultations relevant to this petition, including stating that people and assistance dogs are protected under the Dangerous Dogs Act 91. Under the 91 Act, an attack on another dog could be considered dangerous if the test for the offence is met, including reasonable apprehension that it will injure a person or an assistance dog. Uh, one response to the consultation on the 91 Act review highlighted that it did not raise the issue of whether legislation should be extended to cover attacks on another dog. The Scottish Government's most recent response also sets out the rationale for including assistance dogs in the 91 Act, stating that if an assistance dog is attacked, the assisted person may suffer a significant reduction in freedom through their temporary loss of a dog whilst it recovers or permanent retirement and the resultant wait for a replacement dog. The submission highlights the Scottish Government's intention to undertake a review of the 1991 Act in the near future. Information has been provided by Polmont Veterinary Clinic on injuries and associated costs from dog attacks and other dogs based on details from neighbouring clinics, and these costs, colleagues, are detailed in your papers. Do members have any comments or suggestions? David Torrance. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, considering the Scottish Government's submission and they are going to review the Dangerous Dogs Act, I am wondering if we could close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standards Orders. But in doing so, in closing the petition, I wonder if we could write to the Scottish Government highlighting the evidence from Pullman Veterinary Clinic. I think that makes yeah. eminent sense. Are we agreed on that, colleagues? We are. Thank you very much. So we'll close the petition and uh, forward that evidence to the Scottish Government uh, uh, based on their commitment to undertake a forthcoming and early review. Uh, petition number 1895, Mandatory Accountability for Nature Scots Decision-Making Procedures. Uh, the next petition uh, has been lodged by Gary Wall. It calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make it mandatory for Nature Scott to explain its conservation objectives and decision-making within the framework of the Scottish Regulators', regulators Strategic Code of Practice and the Scottish Government's guidance right first time. The committee wrote to the Scottish Government seeking information on the application of Test 2, including whether assessing licence applications on the basis of there being no satisfactory alternative as opposed to no other satisfactory solution is likely to lead to a different outcome. The Scottish Government sought advice from Nature Scott and responded to state that the terms no satisfactory alternative and no other satisfactory solution are considered to be analogous. This view is supported by the European Commission's recently updated guidance on the strict protection of species, which refers to Bird's Directive case law for the interpretation of Test 2. The petitioner highlights that although Nature Scott references EU Commission guidance, the rejections he has received in relation to licence applications have been on the basis of actions which are not challenged by the EU Commission in other countries. He states that the Scottish Government recognise that proportionality is one of the foundations of regulation, and yet in 10 years of licence refusals, it has never been explained to the petition by what factors have been considered in relation to proportionality. The petitioner concludes by stating that at least, at least a citizen should be able to expect clarity in what the conservation objective is in refusing a licence. Colleagues, do any members wish to comment? David Torrance. Thank you, Kavita, for that. Um, can I suggest that we write to Nature Scott to ask whether it routinely provides information about the conservation objects it is seeking to achieve when rejecting a licence application and whether it plans to do so in the future. We're happy to write to Nature Scott. Any other suggestions that you know, we contend? It seems we're content. We'll hold the petition open and we will write to Nature Scott. Uh, petition number 1897, which is to reform certain of the procedures for the collection of council tax. Uh, this is a petition lodged by Richard Anderson, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to reform those procedures for the collection of council tax, which apply when a person has difficulty in making payment. Uh, we sought views from stakeholders um, when we last considered the petition, um, and we've received responses since then from COSLA, from the Citizens Advice Scotland and Social Security Scotland. In response to petitioners' concerns about individuals not receiving a council tax notice, COSLA suggests that based on the reliability of postal services and availability of e-billing, this circumstance should be, and they say, an exception rather than the norm. Citizens Advice Scotland clarifies a number of points made by the petitioner and makes suggestions for improvements to the council tax system, including a review of the time between the point someone falls behind and the issuing of a summary warrant, as they believe it is currently very short, a review of whether liability for the whole year's council tax should be applied when falling behind one month's payment, and a review of how CTR is promoted and ensuring that all councils have an automatic entitlement for those on qualifying benefits. The committee also asked Social Security Scotland whether systems would be designed to automatically notify individuals if they are eligible for a council tax reduction. In their response, Social Security Scotland states that the Scottish Government has commenced conversations with local authorities about opportunities that might exist to make access to entitlements automatic for clients. One example of this is that Social Security Scotland will explore automatic entitlement to free school meals, school clothing grants and or council tax reduction for those eligible for the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, I therefore, on the basis of that, open up the... Discussion for comments from colleagues. Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think that the information that we've received back, uh, especially from Citizens Vice uh, Scotland, about the timings and the, and the 
ability for individuals and, and the liability that is there for, uh, within this process uh, and the, the increasing awareness uh, that we have. And we have to take on board that, at the moment, uh, the, the whole idea of where we are with funds and support for individuals who are finding it difficult to pay, I think, is, is a very important topic. Uh, at, the, at the present time. So I, I really do think that we need to uh, get more clarity from the Scottish Government as to how they are uh, attempting to bring this forward and if there is the opportunity uh, to undertake the review uh, that, that is being sought here, uh, because I do believe that it does uh, give us uh, the chance to see and to hear uh, what the Scottish Government would be planning to do under the process. OK, thank you. Any other comments? I, I mean, I, I think given the <coughs> follow on from Alexander Stewart support that, I mean, given that Citizens Vice Scotland have indicated a number of specific improvements they think they would like to see made, I'd like to hear what the Scottish Government and COSLA both think in respect of those specific proposals that are made. Uh, and also to ask, you know, uh, to undertake a review of the issues raised, in particular the process by which summary warrants are issued. Uh, and the time scales that are associated with this, because I think that was quite a, a, a you know, quite a significant. When they say very short, I'd be interested to understand that better. Are we content to write the Scottish government, bringing and COSLA asking for their reaction to the Citizens Advice Scotland recommendations. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, petition number one eight nine eight, making entering someone's home without their permission or warrant a crime. And this is our final continued petition this morning from Julia Gow, uh, and it calls on the Scottish Government to make it a crime for a stranger to enter your home without permission or a warrant. A response from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service highlights that the individual facts and circumstances of each case are considered when assessing whether or not to prosecute. It also provides a non-exhaustive list of various offences which may be relevant in a circumstance where a person enters the home or another person without their permission. Uh, similarly, Police Scotland stated that cases are dealt with according to the circumstances and evidence presented, stating that it is unaware of any scenarios where the existing law was insufficient to deal with matters criminally if required. The petitioner's response recognises that there are offences which may cover specific circumstances, but emphasises that no law currently exists for a specific circumstance outlined in the petition. Uh, she states that this is frustrating. Uh, do comments... Come, uh, do colleagues have any comments? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, considering the evidence from the Scottish Government, Police Scotland, the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal, I don't know if we could take this petition any further. So I would like to close it under Rule 15.7 of Standard Orders. Thank you. I mean, I, I do know that Police Scotland do not believe there are scenarios where um, they don't have sufficient powers. Again, I'm, I'm not sure that I bottomed out what the extent of the issue might be, but I think that given what Police Scotland have had to say and the, the evidence response that we've received, I think it's unlikely that the Scottish Government are minded to take the issues further forward. So um, Mr Torrance has suggested we close the petition under Rule 15.7. Do colleagues support that? They do. Uh, so we will close that petition. Um, And thank the petitioner for drawing it to our attention. I mean, it, 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 it must be a very uncomfortable circumstance. Um, our, our third item this morning is consideration of new petitions. We, we just have the one. Uh, and as I say to any petitioner tuning in for the first time, we, in advance of consideration, do send the petition to the Scottish Government to seek their views so that our discussion is just a little bit better informed before we launch into uh, consideration of it. Um, it's been lodged by Wendy Swain and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create a separate department within Social Security Scotland that will fast-track future adult disability payment, ADP, applications for people with a cancer diagnosis whilst they're undergoing treatment. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Martin Whitfield, our colleague this morning, who's joining the committee. I think his first visit to the public petitions uh, process. And we'll hear from him in a moment. But uh, first, I'll just provide some further background on the petition. Uh, 
Uh, the Adult Disability Payment, ADP, will replace the Personal Independence Payment, PIP, in 2022, this year. The Scottish Government's submission states that the definition of terminal illness will be changed under ADP to remove arbitrary time constraints and ensure decisions are better informed by clinical judgment. Research into the impact of this new definition has revealed that the number of people with cancer accessing adult disability payment using the fast track process will more than double compared to the DWP fast tracking. It is estimated that the number of terminally ill ADP recipients who have cancer will increase from 2,800 to approximately 8,200 under the new definition. Uh, you know, a whopping increase. And it is projected that the majority of ADP recipients with cancer, at 62%, will be able to use fast-track processes compared with less than a third who were able to do so under PIP. Further changes to the delivery of disability benefits through ADP are detailed in the Clark's note before you. The Scottish Government has stated that it does not support an additional fast track route specifically for people with cancer and that its approach will not prioritise any single condition over another. The petitioner shares the experience of her family member with incurable blood cancer who has been told that his illness is not affecting his life enough to be in receipt of PIP. And before we as a committee consider this, I'd very much welcome uh, Martin Whitfield and invite him to speak in support of the petition. Mr Whitfield. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to both you and the committee. And a very educational morning it has been too, uh, listening, listening to your debates. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I would like to thank Wendy Swain for bringing this petition. Um, she has shared um, family circumstances which are incredibly trying. And in this week where Friday is, of course, World Cancer um, Awareness Day, it is um, perhaps apt, if only coincidental, that this petition should come before your committee today. Um, we are at the moment of transition from PIP, a Westminster controlled benefit, to becoming adult disability payments here within Scotland where one of the great promises of devolution is the ability to do things differently. Um, and I welcome the additional submissions that the petitioner has made, which I think very eloquently expresses the circumstances of her own family. Um, and can I thank Spice and your clerks for the accompanying notes. If we look at the government's response, which um, came in on the 1st of December, I understand why the substantive part of their response relates to the changes um, for this benefit in respect of terminal illness. But not all cancers are terminal, thankfully. Um, however, cancers affect every individual and family when individuals receive that diagnosis. And the petitioner's um, intentions behind this was to raise awareness of the circumstances where it is not um, identified as terminal early on within the diagnosis, but the effects are still enormous and substantial. Um, I can really do no more than highlight the original um, background information that the petitioner gave, which was that she brought this to ensure the principles of being treated with dignity, fairness and respect are applied to people um, and that they are able to access ADP during the treatment when they most need support. And that treatment needs to begin very swiftly. And it is that point that the financial impact um, of cancer hits families and hits them very, very hard. I know that the government have identified that they don't want to orientate the um, prioritised um, dealing with it by the um, condition, but nearly want to base it on the terminality of the condition. And they have said, and I think we are all in agreement with this, that they hope the voyage of any claimant is far better under um, ADP than ever it is under PIP. And that is both applauded um, and welcome. However, this petition talks about the effect of a cancer diagnosis and how that um, is exacerbated by the experience that this individual petitioner had with a family member trying to um, obtain PIP 
and the stress and mental um, harassment almost that occurred because of um, events that were really out with the individual's control. We need to have a fast track system for people with cancer. I think it is um, certainly uh, uh, one of the few conditions where just the mere name of it um, sends a shudder of fear through people um, who haven't experienced it and are often sitting um, in difficult circumstances to receive that. And then to have the financial barriers that loom so quickly afterwards um, is enormously challenging. And I think both because of this week, but also because of the timing that we're in the process of designing what this benefit will look like in Scotland. It is an opportunity to understand um, amongst the wider um, and through the third party and charity sectors that, that deal um, with cancer, understand how widespread this problem is, but also to understand the significance of why dealing with it quickly um, is a huge benefit to those who are going through the system. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Mr Whitfield. Um, and yes, uh, thank you for, for that contribution, and particularly on behalf of uh, the petitioner. And, you know, I, I do wonder when I read that somebody, notwithstanding however this subsequently is resolved, I do wonder sometimes when someone is told that their illness is not affecting their life enough, um, how, how that definition is arrived at and whether the person imparting that sage advice would feel much the same way if it was being imparted back to them in return. Uh, it, it seems to me remarkably unsympathetic. Colleagues, are there any suggestions how we might proceed? Uh, David Torrance and then Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. I would like to keep this petition open and in doing so, write to Charities Macmillan Cancer and Cancer Research UK to... Um, seek their views on what the petitioner is calling for, but also to seek the views on how improvements by the Scottish Government will affect um, payments for people. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Kenway. I think there is a real opportunity here, as uh, Mark Whitfield indicated in his presentation, uh, to engage with the third sector and to find out. Uh, and, you know, when we are talking about uh, dignity, fairness and respect, under all of this, uh, I think this does fit that criteria to ensure that we at least investigate and see where we can, because for those individuals going through this horrific situation uh, to be given that kind of news and, and then have to cope, uh, uh, as I say, the third sector organisations are there uh, and have a wealth of knowledge uh, and experience of how uh, and what takes place with individuals who are suffering. Uh, so to have their uh, input would be very beneficial and also to find out for the Scottish Government as to how they want to progress this would, uh, as I say, mean that we keep this petition going uh, so that we can clarify and take further information and evidence. Thank you. Anybody else? Are we content then with those proposals? We'll keep this petition open and we'll write to the organisations as uh, summarised. And uh, can I thank Mr Whitfield for joining us this morning and we will hear and consider the petition further when we've received responses to those, those inquiries. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the open part of this morning's Petitions Committee. Can I thank those people who have been following our proceedings and we'll now move into private session. <laughs>